Hey guys, thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. And I hope you enjoyed this interview. Hello, uh, Mr. Zobike, and welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you for joining us. It's bright and it's actually midnight where you are in Canada. Can I see? <laughs> can I see you? Thank you, Director. Can I see him? Thank you for joining us this early, and you are well really suited for me this morning, so I appreciate that. <laughs> why, <laughs> Thank you very much. why you should be sleeping. Now, let, let, let's talk about, I don't know if you were listening to my intro, but you know, this issue of insecurity is one issue that is really dear to my heart because we've been fighting this for a very long time. We've expended so m much uh, money on fighting insecurity in the country, yet, it metamorphoses into a different dimension, and it seems that we cannot control it. How much of a dent is insecurity in the country? I mean, thanks so much, Nancy. The truth is that it's a huge, huge dent on the economy. You cannot have economic growth in a set of insecurity. Um, I listened to your opening remarks, and I completely agree that um, over the past years, we have spent so much on trying to curb this insecurity, but it appears that the results have not been what we wanted. I mean, from the PDP administration to the Buhari administration to the current administration, insecurity has been front and center, but yet it continues to even get worse. Now, there is, an, of course, an element of international um, issues when it comes to insecurity. It's not just a local matter. I remember when the Buhari administration came in, he had to go to our neighbors, Nigeria, Chad, to try and go certain level of cooperation. And we thought, you know, that would solve the problem. I even remember when Jonathan had to get some um, external consultants, if you call it that, and um, contractors to support the Nigerian army to fight insecurity, Boko Haram then. But you know, then it was just Boko Haram, and then it was Niger Delta militant. Now we have bandits, we have the issues in the Southeast, we have, you know, um, like all over the country, there are insecurity issues. And for a country that says they want to grow the $1 trillion economy, that cannot happen under a spirit of insecurity. Like they say, capital is shy, yeah. and capital only goes to where it is welcome. Every businessman wants to invest and make money, and that cannot happen um, in such an environment where people are being kidnapped, people are being killed, and you can't even... The, the, the core aspect of business, which is logistics, moving goods from one place to the other, cannot happen because of insecurity. Mm. What kind of commentary do you get from your clients? Because I know, of course, you, you communicate with investors <clears throat> and your clients all over the world. What, what kind of commentary do you get regarding investment and uh, you know their business concerns in Nigeria uh, regarding insecurity? Do they think, do they think that we have a hank on solving it? No, they don't. It's a serious concern, really. Um, what they've tried to do, most of them, is so they suppose they segregate the country and look at which states <coughs> where they can operate. Some have decided not to come at all. Some who are even in the country have left because they just can't cope. But there are some who are still thinking, okay, maybe Lagos, maybe Ibadan, you know, depending on what your product is and where your services are. But the point is that, um, on one hand, we say, okay, we're a huge economy. We have 20 million people. We have a huge market. That's supposed to be one of our selling points. But if you cannot easily assess that market, I mean, there was a time that even going from Lagos to South East, for example, was challenged. You knew, we remember when going from Abuja to Kaduna was challenged. You cannot travel safely on the roads. You know, people are being kidnapped. Even um, a few weeks back, Abuja itself was under attack by kidnappers and all that. That does not in any way um, show confidence to the investors. And not just look, um, international investors, but even local investors. Um, nobody wants to risk their capital like that because, I mean, there's no, there's no recourse, really. Um, if somebody can walk into your shop and burn down your property or insist that you pay, I mean, we hear about the um, um, farmers having to pay to be able to farm, having to pay bandits to be able to harvest their products. I mean, that is not, that is not, um, it's, it's almost like the nation state is shrinking. The capacity of the nation to protect its citizens has shrunk. And you have these um, warlords kind of taking over um, um, sections of the country. 
Do you think that President Tinubu's um, uh, traveling around the world trying to cut these investors and countries to come into Nigeria to invest, do you think that it, it will yield results amid insecurity, trying to cut them like new brides? Is it even new bride or, you know, you are trying to <laughs> cut a, a, a you, you are seeing a girl you like as a man and you say, okay, I like you and all of that. Can we, you know, have a relationship? That's what President Tinubu is trying to do. Do you think that these people will really listen to what he has to say, bearing in mind that even some of these investors, if not all of them, money goes to where it is safe and secure, actually. And you, you may not even need to cut people at this well when it comes to investment because they even know it better than you, you know. Uh -huh. So do you think it will really yield any results or it will yield results, really? I mean, um, I agree with you that um, some of the investors, I mean, the, the world is a global village now. There's yeah. information everywhere. They can, if you Google Nigeria, they can see all the news items. So it's not like they, they don't know what is going on in the country. There is a place for going around to talk to investors and show that Nigeria is ready for business. There's a place for that. But I would say that it's not enough. You have to be seen to do the primary um, basic things that governments do, which is protects its citizens, protects its businesses. In fact, the primary duty of governments is really protection of lives and properties. The essence of governance itself is to protect people from violence. So, um, yes, you can go talk to investors. They will listen to you. You show um, what you have for them and all that. But can you guarantee their investments when they come in? That is the key question. And to the extent that you can't do that, I will say um, talking to them is not definitely not enough. We have to do that hard work of resolving the security crisis. And it's not just about buying um, attack helicopters and all that. It's really also about talking to the people on ground. I mean, um, I was happy seeing the president in, the, in Niger State meeting with some ex-presidents, IBB and all that. It's important to, to talk with the stakeholders. What are really the issues? Um, are, uh, what are the concerns? How do you get the populace behind you so that you can isolate the bad actors and then see how you can you know, um, manage them? It's not like security will become, um, insecurity will, will go to the zero level, but you must be minimized so that businesses can thrive. That should be the focus of the government. How do you think that this issue of insecurity should be addressed? Bearing in mind of the different efforts that we've seen in the last few years, our budgets in the last few years have been highly concentrated. The major component of the budget has been marked for fighting insecurity of, in, in the country. You've talked about different, is it Tokano jets or what have you, different, you know, different issues around insecurity, a lot of our money is marked for that, but yet insecurity seems to have different dimensions. How do you think we should address it moving uh, forward? Um, President Tinubu has new security chiefs from different parts of the country. President Buhari had a certain group of the country as, as the security chiefs. A lot of Nigerians were not happy with that at the time, yet that did not also yield fruit. This is also the same country where we've heard several times that, oh, we know the people behind the terrorists. Federal government has come out to say that many times. And I'm wondering, you guys know it. So why not name and shame? That means you're also part of them if you're not named. Which, which kind of country is this? You know, so... If we hear things like this in the country, it seems that the, the government authorities actually know those that are doing this. So does it mean that they are pay, paying lip service to read? Because there should be intelligence, even across government, either this government comes and goes, the, the intelligence continues. So what, do, what should this government do in terms of addressing insecurity, bearing in mind all that I have said, putting that into context? I mean, um, and I, again, I agree with you. Um, the first thing is that, the, you, the, as a consultant, the first job is that you have to understand the problem. The insecurity across the country, they may appear similar, but they're not the same. The issue in Niger Delta is different from the issue in the Southeast. The issue in the Southeast is different from what the issues in, in the Northwest and Northeast. The security agencies have to be able to articulate what the issues are really, and then define how best to attack each particular issue. Now, of course, the first thing is that government has, must enhance its capacity for violence itself. The government must get enough arms, train its personnel, motivate the personnel, make sure that the right people are manning the right, um, the, the, um, the right, the right personnel are in place for that. 
they must have that capacity. But aside that, there must be stakeholder engagement. I remember in 2016 or there about when um, we had, a, um, I think the vice president then was acting and, as a president, and we had this huge issue in the Niger Delta. I mean, all production was shut in and all that. The, the acting president then actually went to the Niger Delta, spent a significant amount of time engaging with stakeholders, trying to, to hear them out, had town hall meetings, and that contributed in stemming the tide of the um, eruption of violence then and our production went up after that. So there is also that place of talking to stakeholders, trying to understand the issues, negotiating if you have to negotiate, but we must, we can't be aloof and we can't just throw money at it. We must understand the issues and try to engage each issue based on what this really is. It, I mean, you can't have a, I mean, for example in the Southeast, where for, a, for, for Mondays have become like holidays mm. for the past, Two three years I'm now, telling you. and in a, in a, an environment where trading is actually their mainstay, that is about twenty percent shut of um, shut down of your GDP. You know, banks can open, schools can open, and it, it, it shouldn't be acceptable to any government. You have the Niger Delta currently, where we used to take it for granted that we produce two point two million barrels um, a day. It actually got cut down to nine hundred thousand before we go back to about 1.4 now. It's not acceptable. There's no government that should accept that. Whatever it takes, violence, um, negotiation, whatever, we have to get it done. I mean, with other off offers, um, amnesty in the past, we can do it again if that's what it takes. Are you, it are, you, are you suggesting we should offer amnesty to the bandits and the terrorists, for example, that have kidnapped over 280 uh, 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 people? Definitely not. I'm not suggesting okay. that. So, so, yeah, so what I'm saying is that we have to understand what the issues are and then develop our capacity to deal with them depending on what the issues are. Um, for the bandits, for example, I remember, again, in the last administration, where they were, when they shut down communication for like two months in Zamfara and, you know, told us they were doing this main, major um, military operation. But eventually, you know, we didn't really see the impact of that. I remember some time ago again when they say, oh, Operation um, Rokodile Smiles, Python Dance, and mm. all that. But yet, nothing seems to happen after that. So whatever we are doing has not really worked. And I'm saying that we need to go back to the drawing table again, rather than just throwing money at it, understand the issues. And, you know, there are consultants, security consultants, there are all kinds of negotiations, all kinds of go-betweens that you can have to really, really, really get to the root of the problem. Because what is happening is that we are perpetuating a cycle of poverty and insecurity and more poverty and more insecurity. If businesses mm -hmm. cannot invest, people will not get jobs. If people don't get jobs, they become easy targets for recruitment into this um, banditry. And until you can stem the tide and allow businesses to thrive, you continue having that cycle of doom, if you call it that. Now, how much of the poverty question is um, you know influencing the insecurity situation in Nigeria the more. Um, we have 133 million multidimensionally poor people in Nigeria. So 2022, according to the NBS, and I'm sure that there will be more now, more than 133 million if the NBS conducts that study again uh, today, because we also have the cost of living crisis has <laughs> exacerbated uh, the living conditions of our people. How? Can the federal government, you know, address that, try to address the issue of poverty? Because when you even listen to some of these people when they are, when they are caught, for example, when robbers are caught or some of the bandits are caught by the police, you get to hear them say, oh, I don't get work. Now you make me they do this. You know, there, there, there was a, um, a video that I saw some months ago, I think around the Niger Delta where... Uh, the authorities were clamping down on the oil thieves and they caught the wife of someone that is allegedly involved in that. And the wife said that, I know about it, but I don't get anything. Me and my husband don't get anything. We get children. You know, so things like that. So the reasons given for this is that there's no economic power. So how can the government strategically also look at the issue of addressing poverty? No excuse 
Poverty is not an excuse for crime, mm. and it will never be an excuse for crime. Yeah. But having said that, we also know that when people don't have options, they tend to go, they tend to become easier recruits for um, criminal elements. So we must give people economic options. People must have hope. Hopelessness is a problem, it's a huge problem. Um, how can, what, what, what can government do? The truth is that government is not the entity that really gives jobs to people. Government cannot employ all Nigerians. Government can never do that. Government's main job is to create an enabling environment. Like I said earlier, if their environment is right, businesses will thrive. If businesses will thrive, they will employ people. So there is no running away from at directly attacking the security issues. Government has to deal with that. Else, the poverty situation will continue to um, exasperate. Now, there's an argument of whether is it, is it insecurity that causes poverty or is yeah. it poverty that causes insecurity. Mm. The truth is that it's a cycle. As, as the insecurity improves, poverty improves. But if you can reduce insecurity, poverty will reduce. You have to engage with, it, with the problem. Sometimes it's almost as if we live in denial. We are, I mean, we say, oh, is it political? Oh, no, it's some other factor. If, whether it's political, it doesn't matter. You have to deal with the problem. There is a problem. Farmers can't go to farm. I mean, now we're talking about people hoarding um, food items. We're talking about hoarders because there is scarcity. I mean, in the past years, people have always, we have always traded with Niger and Chad and all that. People have always moved food stuff across the border. It was never a problem because we had enough. Now, farmers can't go to the farm. That is the problem. How will government ensure that farmers can go back to the farm? Some of these bandits, you know, people, people got, a farmer has to pay them to go to the farm. That means they know who they are. So when government says, oh, we know them, of course they know them. What, why are they not being taken out? Why are they not being honored and, and, uh, or, and at least reduce their capacity for violence? Government has to do that. So do you think, that, do you think that the effort you're seeing from government has been enough in terms of tackling insecurity? For example, here in Abuja, we saw what happened in the last few weeks. The, uh, the FCT minister, for example, gave, you know, announced some bounties. And we saw, I think, two of the most notorious I think announced bounties of 20 million naira, if I'm not mistaken. And under a few days, the police caught these people. And I'm wondering, okay, so money is now an incentive for the, for the authorities to do their work, or whosoever they will see blow us out. So you're seeing a different dimension of it. The efforts by the government, federal government now, because I'll come to states in a short while, the states own it, their own, I'll come to it in a short while. Now, for the federal government, do you think that efforts by uh, the federal government has really been enough? Or should there be a change in strategy? Not nearly enough. I mean, the only way to measure whether the effort is enough is the results. It's, mm. not, eff it's not effort. We don't measure effort. You have to measure the results. And the results is saying that they have not even scratched it. Right? In fact, the issues are exacerbated, which is why I talked about understanding the problems. Now... How about, Sometimes when, sorry to cut you short, how about the government coming out to say that, oh, that things are improving, that the situation, the security situation is improving. The government, government has said that. I mean, the government can that say that. That is not I like mean, before anymore. The government can say that. And to be fair to them, certain, it might improve in certain areas. Like, for example, Boko Haram is no, is no more as um, capable as they used to be. It used to be Boko Haram that was the main issue. But if, if Isn't, Boko Haram that, is, is, isn't there a concern? Sorry, I'm cutting you short. Uh, yeah. Isn't there a concern that Boko Haram too has metamorphosed into something else, or, or certain I, I, group of I, people in Boko Haram sect have metamorphosed into certain? They've seen that having a certain, uh, um, being in a certain place does not work. So you you know what I mean? They've changed model. Exactly, and that's the point I was making. That yes. you know, data you can you, data can be interpreted different ways. You can say in this area it's no more as bad as it used to be. Mm. But you have to look at the whole to know whether the effort is really working. You know? So if um if, if you're looking for talking points, you can say, Oh, this area is no more as bad as it used to be, and for that we are we have done well. But that's not enough. We have to look at the entire country. If you had I mean, the truth is that as of today, I don't think there's any state in Nigeria that is free from some form of, you know, large scale violence. And that is not acceptable. The government, you know, must, must, like I said earlier, understand the issues and seek 
to attack them from the roots. Now, what happens again is that, um, for example, you mentioned the Abuja um, case. Yes, mm. there were times when, when, when the issues come to head, we do something quickly, and then it resolves a little bit, but we don't then follow through. I also remember under um, good, good luck, Jonathan, there was a time that Abuja was attacked, you know, bombed and all that, and then that kind of stuff. Even the police but, headquarters, yeah. Even the police headquarters, <laughs> yes. But we managed that, we secured this, the, this thing, but we don't then look at how do we sustain that to secure the country. We must secure the country. We can't just secure, you know, maybe Lagos and Abuja, no. Because we don't farm in Lagos and Abuja. We farm our food security is actually part of our national security. And if the farmers are not safe, we are not safe. So whatever, if, 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 and that's why I talked about having different tools and not just, you know, buying arms. arms buying arms is important. If, if giving bounties works, then let's put, let's put that on the table and give no bounties. If, you know, whatever works, you have to bring them on the table. It's, now, not, it's not about only one thing. We have to bring all the tools on the table and deploy them based on our understanding of each um, situation. The role of states in addressing insecurity, because it seems that it, for most issues, we tend to hammer the federal government a lot without, you know, looking at the states. Because the state governors are just enjoying where they are. You know, cost of living crisis, we are calling federal government. Petrol subsidy, we are calling federal government. Everything, we are calling federal government. The states are not so much in, uh, within the space of our attention. When it comes to insecurity, you will hear governors will say, uh, uh, the security in my state, I, I, I don't even, I can't tell the police commissioner what to do when it comes to that. But when it comes to other things, I'm the chief security officer of this, of this state. I'm the head of this state, so I must, know, I must know what is happening. But when it comes to insecurity, they defer to the federal government. What should be the role of the state governments in averting some of these issues? Because these issues really happen in states. It, well, your question is fundamental to how our nation has been structured and our constitution, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. and that's why many people have argued that um, it's, a, it's almost like we're set up to fail. We need to review you know, some of our provisions on our constitution. I'm happy that, I mean, a few weeks ago, the president has agreed that maybe state police is the way to go. But of course, we know there's a process to that, and hopefully that process gets through. The truth is that the governors cannot be chief executive officers without having, um, chief, sec chief security officers, without having some say in the security architecture of their state. They must have that kind of, that um, space to operate. And, but they must operate within a given guideline. Um, again, a few years ago, under the last administration, in the north, in that, in that north, cent north central and north east, I think, north west, sorry. I mean, different governors were going with different strategies. Um, Erufai then was in Kaduna. He was saying we must fight the bandits to a standstill. Some other governors, I think Castina was giving amnesty to bandits. People were, at, were approaching it differently. And, you know, there was no coherence and it didn't work. Yes, um, I agree that governor, governors must give the capacity to have some stake, some stake in the security of their state. But there must be a general security architecture of, this, of, the, of the federal government and each person must then play their role, including traditional rulers, including um, local government chairmen. Because when it comes to stakeholder engagement, the president will know everybody in your state. You are the one that will bring up the issues. You are the one that will seek the help you need. I have, we have seen, even under the current um, structure, we have seen state governors who did very well with security. Because if you go to the president and say, I need X, X Y, Z for this to happen, the president most times will grant that. If, I mean, governors have requested for deployment of DSS, deployment of police force, army in their states, and it was granted. So it's not true to say, oh, we don't have any capacity. Government, governors have capacity to address security in their states if they show, so wish. But of course, it's easier to complain and point fingers. The truth is that all the, um, at the level of each leadership, from the president to the governors to the traditional leaders, everybody has a stake and everybody has a role to play to ensure that we bring these sec um, security issues um, under control. Now let's take a look at another dimension where the states can actually also function in terms of poverty alleviation for their citizens or for their indigents, as it were. Uh, you also know that their FARC allocation has increased at least since the last few uh, months. Many Nigerians do not even know. But are they telling her now, say, on our state gov governors, they get more money now. And most of them just keep mum. You know, so if they can't address insecurity as it were, since 
They are just chief security officers with mouths. They don't have the power. That is only the IG of police, for example, the chief of army staff that can really send his troops to the estate. Can't they also uh, devise models that can alleviate poverty in their state? There's a cost of living crisis right now in the country. What are the states doing in order to make their indigents not beg for food, not to go hungry? For example, those that were kidnapped from the IDP, hey God, it's, we should just be ashamed of ourselves. From the IDP centers, people still staying in IDP centers, they don't even have food to eat. They went out to look for, and bandits kidnapped them. Such a sorry state. The governors should really be ashamed of themselves. Again, I agree. Um, and I would say that some governors do better than others. I mean, it depends on the capacity, it depends on, on how, what the focus for the, gov for the governors are. But yes, governors are, get, are getting more money, yeah. and that will, that will help them do more if they so choose. And um, unfortunately, politics tends to trump everything. So you see some of them, even when they want to do such um, intervention or empowerment program, that they call it, they, select, they just select people that are there to them, maybe their own party people, or mm. try to empower their own grassroots for the next election and all that. But governance is different from politics. When it comes to governance, you know, the question is, how do I position my state? Like I mentioned about, you know, capital looking for a home where it's welcome. Mm. States can actually choose to become the home for capital. You can actually um, the, um, position your state in a way that people are willing to come and live and work there and invest there because it's safe. And governors have, like I said, you know, a strong role in, in assisting with this um, insecurity situation because they understand the terrain better. Sometimes they know the actors. They know the agitators, they know what the issues are. They can actually either advise the president or even put in their own money. We have known governors that even purchase arms for their police, purchase vehicles and all that to support, you know, mm. um, the capacity. So governors, governors can do more. Now that they have that more money, they can definitely do more. What, what, uh, what do you think that even as citizens that we should do? Um, do you think that Nigerians have, you know, a role to play in terms of, um, you know, getting insecurity, uh, getting it to the barest minimum. Because when you also hear these folks talk, they say, uh, say something if you see something, <laughs> as it were. But there's also this fear that if you say something, you also you have a target at your back. I mean, I, 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 absolutely. The citizens have a, a role to play, definitely. And in fact, the citizens are the first line of defense, if you call it that. But the government must, must then provide that environment for, for that to happen. If citizens don't feel safe reporting, reporting to government, if they don't feel safe sharing information, they will just not do that because, I mean, everyone has a right to protect his, <coughs> um, him or herself. Like you said, um, there have been instances where people gave information and it was traced back to them by the criminals. And so that doesn't encourage anyone. So if there is a safe and um, maybe anonymous way that citizens can give information, I'm sure many citizens will be willing to give information because I mean um, that's how information is gathered really if, if, if citizens are free are able to report maybe what they saw or um, um, suspects and, and all that government can then act on it but in an environment where there's no trust the truth is that there's really no trust between the citizens and the government it's like this trust has been completely broken citizens don't even trust that the government has their interest at heart so why would every citizen you know try to report Government has to end back that trust and then engage each citizen actively in what it's trying to do and how that will help everybody. And the citizens will then play their role. But definitely they have a role to play. Do you think that even with the spate of insecurity that the government can actually bring in foreign direct investment? Is there a way, even in the midst of this chaos, that investments can, can come in and the economy can actually be stimulated for growth? even in the midst of all this brouhaha? Of course. I mean, investments will come in depending on what kind of investment and which area they choose to come. Like I mentioned, you know, they, they look at this, the country, they look at which area that is safer than others, and the investors make their decision. But what, what I want to point out is that um, it's, like, it's almost like if each country is a competition for these investments. Every country is competing to be the bride, to be the place that people come to invest. And what you want to do is to position yourself so you can get everything that you can get. Now, if potentially you can get $10 billion, but you're getting only $1 billion, that is still 
an investment, but that is nearly not enough what you can get. So yes, um, it's still possible to attract some level of investment. I mean, there was um, um, some data that I saw recently where we're looking at all the states and who attracted what. Many states didn't attract anything at all. Yeah, it's but been like few, that for few, many years. Yeah, a few <laughs> might still attract. About 27 states, nothing. <laughs> nothing, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's the situation of things. But I believe that if we didn't have this level of insecurity, if we are investing in our people and educating them and empowering them, we would have been we have we have much more investment because we are we are quite an attractive country. I mean, all the potentials, like we always say, are there for growth. Interestingly, um, of course, we have this Africa continental free trade area coming mm. up. If it gets well implemented, we might even you know become in a in a very in a in a, in a much more precarious situation because. We, we will lose that, oh, we have, we have 200 million people. If someone can go to Ghana or go to Togo and, and set up business and still assess our market, then why should they come to Nigeria if we don't fix this our insecurity problem? So the urgency is now, we have to really, really get this under control. We have to get it under control so that we can then harness that our potentials. Um, Chinedi, if you take a look at it, it's such an interesting dimension you brought out now, the issue of the African continental free trade area. Now, Nigeria is no longer even the biggest market on the continent because we're using that to deceive ourselves. We have, you, we have an African continental free trade area that has a, um, you know, a, a population of 1.3 billion people and Nigeria is about 200 million or 220, depends on. We never do census, so we don't even know how many uh, we are. So if you subtract 220 million from 1.3 billion people, that is the remaining market. So it's such an interesting dimension that you are bringing right now. But if we just oppose that concern, uh, if we just oppose that with what is happening in other African countries, especially the West uh, Coast, Burkina Faso is number one uh, terrorized country in, in the world. That's at the last data from the G GTI. You have countries like Nigeria there. So you're seeing um, issues like terrorism in some other African uh, countries, especially on the uh, Western uh, uh, side. How is it also infiltrating into Nigeria, you know, exacerbating this uh, situation that we have in the country? Because some people have also said that some of these perpetrators are not really Nigerians. They, uh, they, they infiltrate the country from other, other countries. Point. So first to say that the African Contractor Free Trade Area is not yet fully implement, uh, um, in, in implemented. It's been implemented in phases, mm -hmm. but it's certainly coming because mm -hmm. Nigeria has signed up, so that will come. So we still have time to get ready for the full implementation. Now, um, I mentioned earlier that some of the security challenges we have is actually has an international dimension to it. It's not, um, they're not all internal issues. Some of them, especially, you know, from the Sahel area and other. But the fact is that every nation must devise his own countermeasures to protect itself. And that is what we have not seemed to have done well. Um, yes, you mentioned Burkina Faso and other countries. Yes, every country has their own challenges. And Chad. Fact, yeah. yeah. I, I'm sure you're probably following what's happening in Haiti. Yes, exactly. Where, the um, gangs, gangs have taken, gangs over. taken over. And the and president or prime country. minister has resigned. Has, exactly. Gangs so, of like young children, yeah, 12 years, exactly. 13 years <laughs> old. Exactly. So there's no end to where this thing can go if you mm. don't solve it. You don't want to wake up tomorrow and, you know, ban this and tell the president what to do and all that. We mo there's, no, there's no other choice. We have to fix it. And we have to take it seriously. And we have to employ the right people. I mean, I don't want to comment on the appointment that the president has made, but there have been concerns about even the defense ministers that were appointed, whether they were really the right people for, the, for this kind of time. You, um, you, 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 you have to get the right people in place to really take this issue, professionals, and deal with it rather than politicize everything and say, okay, oh, because of this, because of that. We must secure our country. There's no other way. Okay. The, the next two minutes, on a ranking of 1 to 10, how would you rate the government's handling of insecurity in the country since President Tinubu came in in May of last year on a rating of 1 to 10? I mean, um, the president is not yet a year in office, so um, we have to give him, give him a bit of doubt that maybe some of the things um, he's doing might yet work. But like I said, until we see the results, we can't say whether it will work. So, 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 I'll so, give so okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll give, you, I'll give you a five. Okay, five. Okay. All right, finally, what is your outlook for uh, uh, insecurity or for security in the country this year? 
we are just like the third month into a new year. What is your outlook moving forward, especially with the sound bites that we're hearing and with some of the actions that we've seen from uh, the federal government? I mean, I, I want to be hopeful. I want, I want to believe that the, this current government understands the issues and are willing to do what it takes. I mean, the president has said in the past that um, if they make mistakes, they will correct it. Um, I'm hoping that he's seen, you know, what is going on. He'll be able to make changes that are needed, if they're needed. Um, you recall when there was an issue with Niger, and um, initially there was this um, noise about Nigeria, whether Nigeria should invade in Niger and all that, but yeah. the president kind of backtracked. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, people abuse him for that and say that, but I think it shows a man that can make corrections. You know, if it takes a course of action and things that that is not the right way to go, he's not afraid to step it back. So um, I want to believe that they will do what they have to do. Okay. And that, yeah, and, um, and things will improve. Finally, are you persuading investors to come in? Because I know, perhaps here in Canada, I would have spoken to people, uh, whether they are Nigerians that have money, come in, or, or even foreigners. Mm -hmm. uh, are you still persuading them to come into the country and invest despite insecurity? Or, and, I mean, uh, and what is their response to you? Are they sitting on the fence? I mean, I'm always an advocate of Nigeria. I believe a lot in the country, and I believe that the country will do well. And um, yes, that is my job, actually, talking to investors and advising them on how best to come in and where, which areas they can come in. Okay. Unfortunately, some of the bad news that we get, like every day, doesn't help matters. I mean, mm. it, with, with WhatsApp messages, with social media, one, it, once there's an issue, it, in fact, they hear Blow. about it before you do. Yes, everyone. They, they really want to forward it to you to say, oh, <laughs> look at what we had today. Yeah. You know. So, I mean, that's, that, that has been the challenge. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ezomike. Ezomike, isn't it? Did I pronounce that? Yes, yes. Yes. You got it right. Yeah. Yes. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much and have a wonderful weekend. All right. Thank you. All right. I've been speaking with Mr. Chinedu Ezomike, Partner and Head Commercial Practice Group at Anderson, Nigeria. We've been looking at the economics of insecurity in the country. It's really clear that as Nigerians, we are so worried about the situation. We want to sleep with our two eyes closed. And I hope that the president and his colleagues, as he has said, is the driver, every other person. Uh, is it passengers or conductors or wherever they are, we need to find lifestyle solutions to this. Have a fantastic weekend, everyone. Be the best you can be and be the change that you want to see. I am Nancy Naji. Bye. Thank you for watching. In case this is your first time watching us, thank you. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, drop your comment as well as like, and most of all, share our content.